In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about population genetics. So there's two things we want to talk about in general. We want to define what is population genetics, the principles behind it and how it works. And then the next thing we want to do is we want to describe Heide-Weinberg equilibrium, which is a main tool used to study population genetics. So population genetics is defined by the study of the frequency of alleles in a population and how and why those frequencies change over time. It's based on evolutionary principles of variation, heredity, and selection. And so with population genetics, we're really not concerned so much about the individual, right? We're not concerned about the individual person, but rather we're concerned with the population at large, and people are really just vessels, vessels for alleles. We're really looking at how many alleles are in a population and how those alleles change over time. So before we go into Heidi Weinberg, I want to take a brief moment and talk about sort of a case study dealing with population genetics. You know, what is the point? So if you're into ecology, you may have heard of this example before. It's a classic example. But in 1922, uh, the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep were introduced to northwestern Montana, right? Their populations expanded. But over, as over time went on, or sorry, as time went on, excuse me, uh, by 1985, only about 50 sheep uh, were left in this population. So they're really losing their genetic diversity over time due to predation, disease, etc. And whenever you get a very, very low population, you not only lose genetic diversity, but you have the chance of alleles becoming fixed in the population. In other words, when a given allele drops out to be zero, so it's no longer present in the population, you've lost that allele. That fact or that chance of losing an allele in a population when you get a low population is called genetic drift. So genetic drift really is almost synonymous with the word chance. In other words, if you have a small population by chance or by genetic drift, you might have fixation of alleles. You might lose an allele um, and only have one allele dominate that population. And that's what started to happen with this population. So as time went on, more animals were introduced after 85 uh, to try to uh, lead to something called genetic rescue, to try to rescue this organism from the population. And what happened next was that you did get a slight rebound, but if you, if you, you know, look at this data, really the rebound was only to about 120, 130 individuals over the next 20 years. So genetic rescue is not something that is very easily achieved. So let's go ahead and start running through some mathematical formulas here. These are all formulas that you're going to be using uh, as you, you know, go through this unit here. So any problem we do in this lecture, we're going to assume that we're dealing with one gene. Okay, so we have one gene, and this gene has two alleles. So we have two alleles. Big A is one allele, and little a is the other allele. The total number of individuals in the population is n. Okay, n is going to be the total number of individuals in the population. So if we wanted to look at this and see, we said, okay, we have a given population. What's the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals? It would be a very simple formula. The number of homozygous dominant individuals divided by the total number. Makes sense. If we had a classroom of male and females and we said how many female students are in the classroom, we would divide, we would take the females and divide it by the total number of students, right? And that would give us the percentage or the frequency of females in that course. Same thing here. And so uh, what we're doing next is we're actually going to figure out what is the frequency of heterozygotes in that population. So the frequency of heterozygotes is the number of heterozygote individuals divided by the total. Same, homozygous recessive, the number of homozygous recessive divided by the total. These will give us the frequencies of individuals of each genotype in the population. And then we could multiply times 100 for any of those to get the percentage. So you might say, okay, how do we calculate alleic frequencies from a population? So these are actual data, right? Before, on the previous slide, we talked about actual genotypes. Now we're talking about actual frequencies. Eventually, we'll use P and Q and these different values to predict predicted frequencies. But right now, we're doing actual. So again, one gene, right, two alleles. We have big A, we have little a. N is the total number of individuals in the population. So if we want to figure out what is P, what is Q? And you might say, okay, well, P and Q, where did these come from? You know, where, where do we have this P and Q enter? 
So this is where this comes into play, sort of a side note, but an important side note whenever you're dealing with Heidi Weinberg. So if we want to look at the frequency of big A, right, and we want to look at the frequency of little a, you can see in this problem we're dealing with the letters, you know, letter A, right, big A, little a. But in a different genetics problem, we could just as easily deal with the letters B, big B and little b, or F, big F and little f. See how the letter keeps changing depending on what gene we're talking about. We might have A, we might have B, could have D, could have F. If we're changing the letters and we're talking about genes, that's not so much a problem. But once we enter genes into these mathematical formulas, changing the letter in math really does matter. And it could be done easily, but it could be a bit confusing too. So instead of doing that, what we do is we say whatever the big letter is, so in this case it's A, but it could have been anything, B, D, F, X, right, whatever it is, whatever the big letter is, we're going to call it P. Okay, so the big A, we're going to call it P. P is always the big letter or the dominant allele. Little a could be little a, little b, little c, little d, but no matter what it is, we're going to call it Q. Right, so P is the large letter or the dominant allele. Q is the little letter or the recessive allele. And so now knowing that, we're going to go ahead and figure out our formula here. Okay, so what's the frequency of P in a population? So the frequency of P in a population is two times the number of homozygous dominant individuals in the population plus the number of heterozygotes in the population divided by two times the total number of individuals in the population. That'll give us P. So you might say, okay, well, I could plug and chug and I could get that answer, but let's take a moment and reflect how do we get that answer? Where does that come from? And so this is where it comes from. So each heterozygote in the population, if we look at them, they're contributing, they have two slots, right? In other words, they have two copies of each gene because they have two of each chromosome. So if A was lying on chromosome 15, they have chromosome 15 from the mother, chromosome 15 from the father, so they have one copy of each of these genes on each chromosome, right? I said that incorrectly, actually. They have one copy of a gene on each chromosome. So here's one allele, here's another allele. So this person counts as one. In other words, are there a heterozygote? How many big A's are they donating? Each time there's one heterozygote, they're donating one big A. You'll see what I mean in a second when we talk about this. So homozygous dominant individuals here are considered twice as important as heterozygotes for this particular problem. You might say, well, why? Every time you have a homozygous dominant individual, do you see how they're contributing not one big A, but two? So if they're contributing two big A's each time there's one homozygous dominant individual, that's where we actually have to count them as twice as much as the heterozygotes. That's why we have the two in the 2N. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense so far. So now if we're going to go to the bottom of the equation, you might say, okay, well, why do we have 2N on the bottom? Right? Why do we have 2N on the bottom? Well, n is the total number of individuals in the population. That's why we have n. And we have the two because each individual in the population has two chances of donating a big A because they have two copies of each gene. Doesn't mean they're going to donate two big A's, but they have two chances. And that's where we have that two in that formula. Okay, so if that made sense with P, figuring out Q, the small letter or the recessive allele is the exact same thing except we're modifying this part of the formula. We no longer care about the homozygous dominant individual as we did up here because homozygous dominant doesn't give you any little a, right? So now we're concerned with the homozygous recessive individual. And again, we put the two because if they're homozygous recessive, every person is giving two little a's. Otherwise, the formula is the same as above. I personally like these versions of the formulas, but if you are mathematically inclined and you find it easier to look at it this way, you could use these versions of the formula on the right. Uh, these versions are also correct. They're just you know mathematically rearranged a little. So what I would say is, excuse that pop-up. <laughs> what I would say is I would um, you know just cross this out unless you really like it and just focus on these formulas on the left. Okay, so what is Heidi Weinberg law? So now that we talked about some background. We talked about how to calculate the genotypic uh, frequencies that are actually there, how to calculate the allelic frequencies that are actually there. Let's go into Heidi Weinberg law and let's see, okay, what is Heidi Weinberg? So Heidi Weinberg is a mathematical model 
that evaluates the effect of reproduction on genotype and allelic frequencies in a population. Now there's some assumptions of Heidi Weinberg, right? And as you'll see in a little bit, we might say, is it possible to have a Heidi Weinberg population that's truly in Heidi Weinberg equilibrium? And most people would probably say it's not you know, technically possible, right? But in theory, we assume it's possible. So what are the assumptions? So the first assumption is the population is infinitely large. The second assumption is that mating happens randomly. The third assumption is that this population is not affected by mutation or migration or natural selection. So we say, well, what is this population doing? Oh, excuse that pop-up. Let me get rid of that in one second. Hopefully that doesn't come up again. <laughs> okay, so um, you might say, well, what's this population doing? Is this population just eating and breeding and eating and breeding? And that's exactly what they're doing. So basically we're saying, what happens to the aleic frequencies in this population if this population has nothing happening to it? That's what we're asking. It might seem sort of silly. You might say, well, what's the point of that? Nothing's going to happen to that population. And you're right, but, but think of it this way. We have to know what nothing is first before we could look at the effect of different factors on a population. So for example, if we wanted to look at the effect of mutation on a population and say, how does that affect allelic distributions? We have to know what happens first when there's no mutation. And then we can consider the case of mutation. So in this lecture, we're focusing on the nothingness, right? So when you, you're finished with this lecture, someone said, what did you watch? You could say, I watched a lecture about nothing, right? <laughs> Which was going to be true. But it's an important lecture because we're saying, what's the baseline? And then once we know what happens when nothing occurs, then we could figure out what happens when a mutation occurs. Okay, give me a second to figure out what's going on with this window pop-up. I'm going to get rid of that, and then I'll be back with you shortly.